Today we're finishing up a series that I started in January. I got COVID and sick and on the couch for a week and that sort of thing. And I had uh, Pete pinch hit for me and Frank pinch hit for me. So I'm going to come back. We're going to finish it today. And this series is called Science, Genesis, and the Truth. And I want you right now to pull out your phones. And I want you to snap this QR code. Can you bring it up? Are we connected? Are we? There we are. Good. Inevitably, you're going to have questions right after the service. I'm going to go out to the football game. I'm going to show you how to throw a football. I'm coming for Jalen Hurts' job. And then at 11.35, we're going to be right here. And I'm going to answer all of your questions. So questions, I want you to text the questions. I want you to be here. If you don't text the questions, I will be here until the last person leaves. You don't have to stay the whole time. It's not going to go that long. But we're talking about something that is going to make Christians uncomfortable. And I would encourage you to go back and watch the first week in January 1st. The Bible tells us, Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that you have. And the things that we're going to talk about today, they will make you uncomfortable, but you have to grapple with these things for two reasons. Number one, if you don't, and if you don't have a discussion with your kids and the people that you love, they're going to go off to the university and they're going to get slaughtered and they're going to lose their faith. They're going to get made fun of. There's going to be a reasonably intelligent graduate assistant that's going to make them feel stupid, and I want them to be able to show up to the university and school these graduate assistants. Second reason is you're going to have conversations with reasonably intelligent people that are far from God that have genuine questions about this, and you need to be able to say, I've wrestled with this too. Here's what I think Genesis is trying to communicate. And I'm going to help you do that today. Now, in, Gen in January 1st, I said four things. Number one, the earth is not 6,000 years old. If you came from a church background where they taught the earth is 6,000 years old, they were taught that and they were taught that. And it goes back to Archbishop Usher in the 1800s. And it's not. Fundamentalist Christians who think the earth is 6,000 years old, the problem isn't that you don't understand science. The problem is that you don't understand literature. We're going to explain that. Number two, the earth was not created in six literal days. You know how in Genesis 1 it says, and he created this and it was evening and morning the first day, and evening and morning the second day, evening and morning the third day. It's not there to communicate that God basically got super tired out after a day and he had to stretch it out over seven days. It was the Hebrew word yom is the Hebrew word for a period of time. And it's trying to communicate that there was intelligent design instead of like the Babylonian creation myths. Number three, I said in January, you can believe God used evolution to create humans and still be a devout follower of Jesus. I grew up in a context where that was not true. That was not allowed. You had to choose one or the other, and that's simply not the case. There are many good Christians that believe God used the process of evolution to create us as human beings, right? This is called theistic evolution. Um, one such person is C.S. Lewis, the great apologist from the 20th century. The other one is, you might have heard of Francis Collins. He was the leader of the Human Genome Project. He believed that theist, theistic evolution brought human beings to, to pass, but God used that process. He then wrote a book called The Language of God, which I would encourage you to read, which is a defense of the Christian faith based on science. Fascinating. We talked about in January about how there are four periods, and where did my stone hammer tool go? It was here. It's right in front of my face. Yes, we are the culmination of God's special work in humanity. Um, oh, I feel like I'm going to do Okay. Uh, this is all agreed upon. No one's disputing this. Creation 4.6 billion years ago. First humans appeared 200,000 years ago. The first written language, 3,200 in Samaria, uh, in the little crescent. And then Genesis 3 is written roughly around 1,500-ish, maybe a little bit later. We don't know. Jesus is in 6 BC. Had a great weekend. We started last weekend with the financial learning experience and Joe. Hopefully everybody's fired up. And um, we had a financial learning experience on Monday and then night to shine. And I'm just watching these volunteers. It's amazing, you know, we're picking up and moving stuff. So Lisa's exhausted. 
I wanted to take a break. So we went to the Perkiomen Trail and went for a walk. After about 30 minutes, Lisa was like, I'm going to keep going. And then me and Meadow were like, peace out, you know? So she keeps going, and I go down, and I start looking for ancient tools. Here is a hafted hammerhead. Found it just yesterday. You can see it. Hafting means it's cut out with a pexel, and um, you, this is a, you can see how it's uh, grooved here, and this was used as a hammer. This comes from the Mesolithic period, which was about right here, okay? We talked about how the book of Genesis is written for people who use these, but never seen a light bulb. And um, it's important that we understand the context where the book of Genesis was written, right? Fourth, I said, the creation account in Genesis 1 through 3 is historical but not literal. I talked about how Genesis 1, the universe was created, and then evening and morning, the first day that human beings, this is 100% to happen. We believe this as the disciples of Jesus, right? Look to the person next to you and ask them, are you real, right? You're here, right? You see the person, right? You see them, right? You're standing on terra firma, right? This is real, right? We believe, and we believe that God is the first cause that make that happen. Back in the Big Bang, what existed before the Big Bang, no philosopher will tell you. No astronomer will be able to tell you. We believe that because of the resurrection of Jesus and him stating that this is true, that because of the resurrection of Jesus, we believe God created this. We believe there's evidence for this. So Genesis 2 and 3 is the story about God created Adam. Adam, which means dirt, red clay. He picked up dirt and he fashioned a human being out of it and grabbed its nose and went <laughs> into the nose and then the person went like. And then God looked at the man, Adam, and he said, there is no person that can be a companion for this person. So he grabbed a rib, fashioned it, took it, went. <laughs> and there's Adam and Adama. We believe that story was told to explain the cosmological, the physiological, and gosh, there are just so many, the, the reality of human beings to people who used these. Because if God tried to explain to us right now what happened in Genesis 1, we would be like, duh, right? Because science is constantly moving. We're constantly learning, right? And so Genesis 2 through 3 is communicating this, but in a... In a um, a typical fashion. Fifth, and this is where we're going to jump into it today, and I just want to say this is going to cause you a little bit of consternation, and that can be good because you have to be able to sit across someone that's far from God and say, I've wrestled with this too. So fifth, the stories in Genesis 2 through 11 are what biblical scholars call etiologies. I want you to pull out your phone and take a picture of this. This is important. An etiology is a short story that explains the origin of something. What's an etiology? A short story that explains the origin of something. So Genesis 1 is historical. It actually happened. Genesis 2 through 11 talks about Adam and Eve. Go to the next one. Here we go. There we go. It talks about Adam and Eve and Cain and the snake in the garden. Genesis 5 through 10, it talks about eight, 900-year-old people. Genesis 6, the Nephilim, the giants. Genesis 6 through 9, the flood, Noah and the ark. And then Genesis 11, the Tower of Babel. Right up here in Genesis 1 is creation. This happened. These are etiologies. They are stories to explain something. And let me just go into them one by one. And I'm telling you, just wrestle with this. We will all come together at the end, okay? Here we go. The first etiology is Adam and Eve. And so you remember what an etiology is, right? It's a short story to explain something. Chapter two, we're told this. 
But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs, closed up the rib of flesh. Well, I just enacted that, right? Brought the woman to the man, and the man said, this is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She, she shall be called woman, for she is taken out of man. Now I want everybody to read the next four words together. That is, three words. <laughs> that is why. Ready? Let's read it together. That is why. This story of Gumby being created and breathed in the Nasama, the soul, is being told for a reason. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh, and Adam and his wife, and I mentioned in January, this is how you know that they were in their early 20s. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. All right? So, but that is a story. That is an etiology. Okay? The story of God taking dirt, which we believe, we are carbon-based life forms, right? There's this, is, this isn't a story of going in the universe and taking unicorns. and No. Carbon-based life forms were created. Why? What does the story explain? Why we have marriage. Uh, Grandma, why do people get married? That's a good question, Junior. Um, well, in the beginning, uh, God took dirt, and he fashioned a human being, blew it up, and it was lonely. And God said, it's just not right that humans would be alone. And so a woman was created, and they came together, and this is why we have marriage today, because God wants us to live in community. That's an etiology. Let's go to the next one. Etiology number two, people that lived for centuries. Some of you that have never read this before, this is interesting. Um, after Seth was born, this was Adam's son, Adam lived 800 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Adam lived a total of 930 years. And then he died. And when Seth had lived 105 years, he became the father of Enosh. Can you imagine? For those of you, my friends, that had kids in their 40s, can you imagine being 105 they get colicky? Can you? No, 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 right? So, and after he became the father of Enosh, Seth lived 807 years. Altogether, Seth lived for 912 years, and then he died. And then Enosh had lived 90 years, and after he became the father of Kenan, and eight, oh my gosh. And then the oldest person in the Bible, when Methuselah had lived 187 years, he became the father of Lamech. Can you imagine? And after he became the father of Lamech, Methuselah lived 782 years. Altogether, he lived, what? 969 years. Jesus, at his age at 30, was older than 80% of the people he was speaking to. He was considered geriatric because of the mortality rate. Do you think 3,500 years ago people live to 969 years. If you're going, that's exactly what the writer of Genesis wants you to do. And I'll explain that. The reason the Genesis writer is including this story, I'll explain in a second, is so you will go, seriously? Here we go. Etiology number three, the Nephilim, the giants. Later in the Bible, God's people are in captivity in Egypt. Moses raises them up, leads them out. They go wander through the desert. They go south of the Dead Sea, come up around in Jordan. And I wanted to go there in March, but I can't. Um, there's this archaeological trip that's going. That, that going up out of the Dead Sea, coming over on Mount Nebo, Moses looks out and God says, you're not going in. And they were like, these people, what are we going to do? How are we going to live with them? They're going to annihilate us. So they sent some spies. Remember that story? They sent spies and they scouted them out. And it said the spies came back with a bad report. You know what the bad report was? And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. They said the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw are of great size. 
We saw the Nephilim, the descendants of Anak, come from the Nephilim. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. 3,500 years ago, well, 2,000 years ago, we know for a fact that the average size of a man was five foot three. Jesus was no taller than five foot three. That was a healthy man based on the graves that have been excavated from Palestine from the first century. Do, let me ask you this. So they come back with a report and they tell everybody, we're gonna get wiped out. There are people that are like six two. They're gonna crush us. Looking around at people that are like four, five, four, eight, five foot tall, and they're like, they're giants. Let me ask you, for those of you who have gone through a seventh grade biology class, why do people, why are some people taller than others? I'll give you 10 reasons. Number one, genetics. Number two, genetics. Number three, genetics. Number four, genetics. Number five, genetics. Number six, genetics. Number seven, genetics. Number eight, protein. <laughs> Number nine, overall family health. And then the 10th reason is right here in the Bible. Your great, 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 great grandma had sex with an angel. <laughs> Don't believe me? Genesis chapter six. This is the third etiology we're looking at. When human beings began to increase in number on the earth and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw the daughters of humans that they were pot, and they're like, we're gonna give you some of that. <laughs> mm-hmm. Like these people up here in heaven are ugly. So they married anyone that they chose. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward. And when the sons of God went to the daughters of humans and had children by them, they were the heroes of old, men of renown. And etiology is a short story that explains the origin of something. What is this etiology explaining? How we get tall people. This is all going to come together here in a second. Etiology number four, the flood, Noah, and the ark. Chapter seven, if you've never read this, this is interesting. The Lord said to Noah, go into the ark, you and your whole family, because I found you righteous in this generation, and take with you seven pairs of every kind of clean animal, a male and its male, one pair of every kind of unclean animal, a male and its mate, and also seven pairs of every kind of bird, male and female, to keep their various kinds alive throughout the earth. Seven days from now, I will send rain on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights, and I'm going to wipe from the face of the earth every living creature that I've made. For 40 days, the flood kept coming on the earth, and as the waters increased, they lifted the ark high above the earth. The waters rose and increased greatly on the earth, and the ark floated on the surface of the water. They rose greatly on the earth, and all the high mountains under heaven were covered with water. Every living thing that moved on land perished. Birds, livestock, wild animals, all the creatures that swarm over the earth, all mankind, everything on dry land that had the breath of life in its nostrils died. Every living thing on the face of the earth was wiped out. People and animals and creatures that move along the ground and the birds were wiped out. Only Noah was left and those in the ark. The waters flooded the earth for 150 days. But God remembered Noah and all the wild animals and the livestock that were with him in the ark, and he sent a wind over the earth. And the waters receded. Now the springs of the deep and the floodgates of the heavens had been closed, and the rain stopped falling. The water receded steadily, and at the end of 150 days, the water had gone down, and on the 17th day of the seventh month, the ark came to rest where? On the mountains of Ararat. That's a pretty heavy story, isn't it? Have you ever talked to someone that's far from God and they're like, how can God love human beings and God completely wipes out all of humanity and you're telling me that God is a loving God? Let's get to that. Where is Mount Ararat? This is a map. Um, uh, it, it makes me sad just to look at this because my friends that are in Antakya, um, so down here is Israel. I was to be in the middle of June at a biblical archaeology conference in Antakya, but the city, this is ancient Antioch. 
Where were the disciples of Jesus first called Christians? Acts chapter 11, in Antioch. That's that city. Here's the epicenter of these earthquakes. Entire city level. Entire church level. Pastor in our community, he died, she died, and one of their children died and the other one lived. This is terrible. Anyway, the red dot, that's Mount Ararat. Here's a picture of Mount Ararat today. It's 16,945 feet high. It is the highest mountain in what is called the Fertile Crescent. Based on fossil evidence, there was an ocean 23 million years ago that went up to the base of the mountains. Here's the etiology. Imagine if you're in Denver and if you're a small kid and you're, and you're constantly looking up at the mountains. You're going to ask a question about the mountains, aren't you? Yeah. Same thing if you live at the base of this mountain. Noah's Ark explains two important truths. First, what the heck is that mountain all about? And then second, it explains our origin story. Hey, Grandma, where do we come from? Can you go back to the mountain? Go back to the mountain. Where do we come from? Wait, do you see the top of that mountain? That's where we come from. All of humanity came from the top of that mountain, and we came from that mountain. We did, from the top of that mountain. You heard the same thing if you grew up, say, in Athens. Where, are, where did the gods live? Top of that mountain. So you can imagine a conversation that goes like this. Child says, Mom, where do we come from? The mom says, see that mountain up there? That's Mount Ararat. Everyone on earth came from that mountain. That makes us special. Child, what do you mean we're special? What do you see? We're the original people. We were here first. Our people were saved because we were good. Unlike the people that don't look like us that are traveling through our city that come from far places, they're the bad people. We're the good people. That is the reason Noah and the ark is there, to explain why we're better than other people. It is an origin story. Now, I believe there actually was a flood. There are other historical texts from that time period, the Enuma Lish and a number of them, that talk about a flood. Was it a worldwide flood? Eh, probably not. Was it a regional flood? Yes. Did a lot of people die? A whole heck of a lot of people died. And I'll explain why in a second. But it, it, there was a flood. And I'll explain why this is included in the Bible. Why would you even include the story in the Bible? What does this have to do with us and Jesus? I'll explain it here in a second. The fifth etiology, the Tower of Babel. Genesis 11 says, now the whole world had one language and a common speech. And as people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. And they used baked brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. This is an actual historical period that is taught in your child's uh, Eastern civilization class. It actually happened, right? Where they went from hunter-gatherers to what? Communities farmers, all of this, building cities. Then they said, come, let's build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. And the Lord said, if as one people speak in the same language, they have begun to do this, then nothing's gonna be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. And so the Lord scattered them from all over the earth, and they stopped the city, and now everybody together, let's read the three words together. That is why. That is why it's called Babal. Do you know you have that, that uh, was it misonomia? What is that thing where, where if other people eat around you, like, you're like, you're driving me nuts with this eating sound. Do you have any family members that do the whole, stop chewing so loud, right? That's what this is. It's, a, it's an awkward noise that you're hearing. The Hebrew is confusion, right? And this is why it's called confusion, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world, and from there the Lord scattered them all over the face of the earth. And what is this etiology? 
What does the etiology explain? An etiology is what? Short story that explains the origin of something. The Tower of Babel is a story that explains, number one, why do people speak different languages? Well, because people were trying to build a tower up to God and God came down and saw them and said, Spanish, French, German, right? English, Portuguese, right? That's what an etiology is. Hey, Grandma, why, does there, why do they speak a different language than us? Well, let me tell you. And she would point to this. What is this thing? What is that? That's a ziggurat. There are 25 of them all throughout the ancient Mediterranean world, primarily in Iran and Iraq. What is a ziggurat? A ziggurat does two things. Number one, you climb up the stairs to get to the gods, and number two, you escape the floods. Floods were a big deal in that area. Okay. Now that you have a lot of questions, let me try to put this together. First, as disciples of Jesus, we believe Genesis 1 was a fact. It actually happened. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God did not say how he created human beings. We just know, based on science, that roughly 200,000 years ago, humans first showed up. That is an undisputed fact. Second, understanding Genesis 2 through 11 as etiologies makes me trust the Bible even more. Let me explain. Come on. There we go. High board. Okay. So this is Genesis 1. This is going to put it together for you, right? We have um, human beings were created. The earth was created. That is a fact. You see each other. We're here. That was a fact. The Christian faith begins in Genesis 12 with the call of who? Help me out. Abraham. All of this stuff in Genesis 2 through 11 is their story. Nine hundred year old dude. Noah. God killing people with the flood. Tower of Babel. This is included in the Bible because if we were hired to write a history of the United States, and in our history book, we purposely left out the Civil War and slavery, would that be an accurate? picture of the history of the United States? Of course not. How could you even possibly talk about the United States without the Civil War and without slavery? It's the same thing. This, these are their stories. God's story begins here, and then it begins with Abraham. Okay? So this is important. Oh, there we go. Sorry, I have to get all of it. I do. There's no way I can. Okay. This is Abraham in Genesis 12. Abraham. And you go all the way through. And it leads to Jesus. This is where our faith begins with Abraham. The gospel begins with Abraham. Abraham. The reason Jesus was a Jew and not French, which can you imagine? <laughs> the reason he was a Jew, because it's the promise to Abraham that he's going to bless the world. What is included before this from Sumeria to Sumerian history, it is a nice to know. If you've ever read and flipped through the Bible and you go, say, like through the book of Chronicles or Leviticus, 
And you're like, what the heck is this stuff? Why is that there? It's the same way. The over here, the tower and the flood, they're all stories that people use to explain stuff. So we don't actually believe that's why people, now, let me just say, could God have caused confusion and made people speak different languages? Of course. Could God, could, could God have allowed people to live 900 years? Of course he could. But we don't have to choose because it's not our story. It's their story. And when you were in, at, in Abraham's time and you're gonna, you start to tell this story and you hand them a document and it doesn't include the flood and the Tower of Babel and Noah and that kind of stuff. They would have read this and they were like, wait a minute, where's the Civil War? Where's slavery? Where? And so it's put in there, sort of like Chronicles. It's there, but we're not gonna lose our faith over it and we're not gonna sit down having lunch with someone that's far from God and have them make us feel stupid because they're like, seriously, 900-year-old people? We're like, yeah, it's pretty crazy too, isn't it? That's... Yeah, it's, it was just included there because it was an etiology that other people needed to include in the story. Here we go. Third real fast, and I'm done. Third, so Genesis 1, the creation of the universe, it's historical, it's real. And then I said, the gospel, fourth, the gospel of Jesus begins with the call of Abraham. And I want to read this so you, everybody gets this. Come on. Come on. Bam. Here we go. If you had, this is why Jesus came. God calls Abram from that area on the map where all those stories existed. The flood, the tower, all of that. Abraham left all of that, came to Israel, and it says this. Go from your country, your people, your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you and I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, curse those who curse you, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And that wasn't happening. That's why God sent Jesus. That's why Jesus was a Jew. This is our faith. These other stories, they're just there. But this is our story. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for the fact that we can trust your word more, that we can trust that Genesis 1 is historical, it's real, it actually happened, that everything after Genesis 12 was real, it was historical, it actually happened. And so we're not really bothered by the other stuff. It's not our story. It was just a nice to know, but it wasn't a half to know. And we thank you so much, God, that science informs our faith. We have nothing to fear there is nothing going to be discovered. There is no insight that we can walk strong, confident in who you are, who you created us to be, and the message that we have to give to the world. We thank you for this. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for watching today's message. Make sure to check out Brian's new book, Finding Favor, God's Blessings Beyond Health, wealth, and happiness. To sign up for Brian's newsletter, please go to Brian's website at brianjones.com.